Um, we were speaking about the basic idea that we come from the wisdom of God, a wisdom that is like, um, uh, it's a wisdom that cares, a wisdom like a parental wisdom. That's the parable we gave. Uh, we also said that the reason the Rabbi Shnel Zaman of Liari, the author of the Tanya, emphasizes the roots of the soul is to remind us that we indeed have a treasure in here that we ought not to ignore. And sometimes we may see others as less, but really we are more than we can ever think. We're a part of God himself. We spoke about those two types of loneliness. If you remember, loneliness that filled with shame, loneliness though that comes from this a sense of tremendous value. I'm alone. I have a unique worth that only I can bring to the world. Uh, that was the big idea of last week. I will continue. Let's continue at the bottom of page 132. Does anyone want to read? Anyone? <laughs> Nobody else ever wants to read. Okay, good. So, Margo, go for it. Continue. Okay, okay. And although the Holy One, blessed be he, is called Ein Sof, infinite, and his greatness can never be fathomed, and no thought can apprehend him at all. That is, not only is our earthly intellect an inadequate tool to comprehend God, but no thought at all, not even the spiritual perception of the supernal angels can possibly comprehend him, because the infinite is, by definition, incomprehensible. And so are also his will and his wisdom. These, as explained earlier, are synonymous with his being. As it is written, there is no seeking his understanding. And can you by searching find God? And from my thoughts are not your thoughts. The right. author, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, we'll continue in just a, just a brief moment. But uh, um, there's this enigma about God and about our relationship with God. And that is that on the one hand, we say that God is a part of us and he's, he's one with us. And that's the soul. And so he's as close as could be. On the other hand, <laughs> God is also as distant as could be. Because as he explains here, his, his greatness can never be fathomed. No thought can apprehend him at all. There is no seeking his understanding. My thoughts are not your thoughts. All these verses that tell us that he's as far as could be. Because really, he'll never be able to be to be grasped in any shape or form. So there's, there's this paradox that on the one hand, I'm very, very close, as close as could be. On the other hand, I'm as far as could be. And that's really the relationship we have with God. That on the one hand, yes, we feel him. Yes, we sense him. Yes, we can connect to him through mitzvahs, as we mentioned before. But also, as we connect to him, dare we not think that that's it. We've uh, reached that level of godliness in which... Uh, we understood it all, and there's no other, you know, we're, we became God. But um, we also have to under realize that, that that journey is truly infinite, and that, um, that God will never be able to completely be controlled by us or grasped by us and, and understood by us. Um, there's a verse that says, uh, 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 there's a verse in Isaiah that says that, Karov mikol karov, aval rachok verachok mikol rachok. If I'm quoting it correctly, it says that God is closer than anything close, but he's also distant than anything distant. And um, reminds me of a poem that a Hasidic rabbi once wrote, a poem that says that, uh, God, I yearn for you so strongly, and I want to be one with you so strongly that... Um, if I had a golden ring, I would give it to you. If I had wings, I would fly to you. If I had, um, if I had um, treasures, I would give them to you, something like that. Uh, if I, I would give. If I, I would give. That, that's how the poem goes, that, that repetition. But what the Hasidic Rebbe was saying is that really when we think about it, we can't give anything to God because God is, is beyond everything. You think a, a, a golden ring will matter to him? Mm -hmm. It's not going to matter to him because it's, 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 again, infinite. But on the other hand, we also have this, what we do have, and that's what he conveys through this poem, is this yearning, the soul that is one with him. You know, the, on a similar vein, I know this needs explanation, but on a similar vein, the, the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shnozan Mavliadi, the author of this book, 
he uh, was once found, you know, he would, he would enter these states of ecstasy upon meditation and upon prayer, uh, very different from other Hasidic rabbis, but he would actually demonstrate it against, you know, against his will, I'm sure, and not under his control. But they once found him rolling on the floor and he was shouting, Mili vim It's another verse from Isaiah that says that um, who uh, I, I do not need your land and I do not need your heavens. And he was saying, saying to God, God, I do not need your land. I do not need your, your heavens. I do not need your world to come. I do not need your rewards. All I want is you alone. That's all I want. Hmm. And uh, in a way, I think this, this <clears throat> relates to this enigma that we have within us. We have God within, right? That soul. And that soul as it's... It's, it's never ending yearning to be one with God because it knows that it is one with God in essence. On the other hand, as it tries to actualize its yearning, it also understands that it will never be able to fully get it, to fully comprehend God and to fully say, okay, now I've hugged God and I'm completely, he's completely, his entire self is completely in my hands. That's, that's really the, the big enigma. On the other hand, I think that's also the essence of Judaism. Rabbi Steinsatz would say something very harsh, but, you know, he could be very, very harsh. He would say that once the animal soul that we've been speaking about, or the evil inclination, has controlled and conquered the essence of the person, then he'll leave him, uh, he'll, he'll let him have everything else. He'll let him have a beard. He'll let him have payas. He'll let him have Torah. He'll let him have mitzvahs. He'll, he'll let him have everything. Because he got his essence. Once he got his essence, he'll let him have everything else. You know, referring to some people, how they could be so, you know, religious on the outside, but sometimes the essence is missing. So I asked him, what's the, what's the essence? And he said, the essence is that specific yearning that we're speaking about. That yearning that, that we, we have this sense, this feeling, maybe that does not exist all the time, but certainly exists from time to time, where we say, I don't care about this world. I don't care about heavens. I don't care about the rewards. It's not about me. I want to be one with God. Like a child, like a little baby who's eaten already and who's, who's, who's completely satisfied. All it wants is to be in the arms of his mother. Same here. There's this deep yearning. I want to be one with God because I am a part of my mother. I am a part of God. On the other hand, I also understand that as I actualize this yearning, I'll never be able to grasp that entire God. He'll, be, he'll remain way beyond me. So it's that paradox that is found constantly in life. But as long as it exists, it means that the animal soul really hasn't conquered our essence. Second, uh, <clears throat> uh, our yearning goes and that, 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 that desire, that very strong desire to become one with God, to even sacrifice ourselves for God is, uh, is gone. That's when we know that, that uh, the evil inclination, the animal soul has conquered us completely like um, another very harsh statement by, I think, by Rabbi Simcha Bunim of Shizcha, or it could be by his counterpart, the Kotzka Rebbe, who was known to be very fiery and a man of truth, like Rabbi Steinsaltz. But there's a statement in the Talmud that says that a person should always feel as if the evil inclination is about to chop his head. So you shouldn't <laughs> think that he conquered it. And uh, someone came to him and said, but Rebbe, what if I don't feel that? So the Rebbe says, and that's a sign that he already chopped off your head. Yeah. Yeah. But in a way, if we don't feel that sense, I'm, I'm comparing this to, to what Robert Stanz was saying, if we don't feel that deep burning desire inside to, I don't, it's not about, I don't want anything. I just want God alone. I, I, I want to give myself to him. Then Rabbi, Rabbi, I, I, I hear what, what I hear you say the same thing over and over again, and it's a circle and the circle is it's time to get off the merry-go-round and stop yearning and know that it's already there and, and, right. and, and just do it and be there and right. stop your stop your yearning, stop your yearning, be there, accept it. Yeah, but on the other hand, it takes it takes a lot of work to, to get to that recognition it, it so, does take a lot of work you're yeah, right yeah 
And, and to say it is easy, but to actually feel it, to actually, you know, it's interesting speaking about Rambach Steinsaltz, but uh, I think he was a man of that, that really embodied what we're speaking about. But um, I, I received the confirmation that he indeed was that embodiment of, of that deep yearning and that yearning that is never satisfied just to be one with God, not to want anything from God, not for any selfish reason, just to, because he's a soul and a soul has to, to, to a soul, just like a flame, right? Aspires to become one with its source. But I, I received the confirmation because uh, he had a stroke about four years ago. And I remember, I, I, I remember seeing a tremendous change in him after the stroke, a change that remained after his, until his passing. And that is that apparently the, the part of the brain that is responsible for restraining our emotions was hit in the stroke. So he would cry very easily. Mm. He would also smile very easily. And he was a man of tremendous emotions after the stroke because of this. And I remember that each time he would speak about God or someone would tell him a story about that yearning, he would cry, it would just erupt in tears. And that's the level I was saying to myself, you know, the stroke was a terrible thing for my rabbi. On the other hand, it also taught me what, you know, what I yet have to achieve. What, what was the emotion he was feeling, do you think? I think an emotion of, I, I don't know, but his, his, his face would light up and, and just cry uncontrollably. I, 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 I'll tell you, I mean, I'll, I, I'll tears of joy or tears of sadness. I think, I think not, uh, neither. I think tears of yearning. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but I think I, I'll tell you, I mean, I'll, I'll, a little example, but again, just to emphasize this point right here. And that is that I remember asking him to confirm a story for me. He couldn't speak much after the stroke. The story was about his son, Manny, who some of you have met, and Manny was in uh, Richmond, Virginia for a few years, um, helping the Jewish community. And he had told a story to his father, who then his father would tell many, many times. And then after the stroke, I wanted to confirm the details of the story. So I asked Rabbi Stans, can you confirm the story? And when I told him the story, he erupted in tears as we were describing. I asked, so what's the story? The story is about two young kids who would not stop fighting, two siblings who would not stop fighting. And uh, the parents did not know what to do and they consulted with many. And um, many at, at one point told them that maybe you should uh, put them in the same room when they go to sleep at night and see what happens. Because sometimes you, you know, sometimes they fight because we don't give our children the opportunity really to bond with one another. And sometimes we're too much also strangling them that we don't give them that space. So, so they can't develop a real relationship. So put them in the same room tonight. Let's see what happens. And they put them, they said to them, you know what, we're changing rooms. You guys are gonna to sleep together. And of course the parents are there by their door trying to listen to, <laughs> to see if they have to, to call the firemen and rescue something. So, <laughs> so uh, they're both put to bed and then all of a sudden the seven-year-old boy who was picking on his sister all the time gets up from his bed and the parents are watching this from the side, not knowing that they're being watched, approaches the five-year-old girl, his sister, and he asks her the question, tell me, can you teach me how to speak to God? Yeah. Because yeah. I've already forgotten. And how much Stanis would cry each time he would tell this story. Yeah. Knowing that this soul, right, is so very much alive and, and yearning uh, in children because they, they aren't tarnished yet by life, by life and its challenges. And uh, again, when Robert Stans would tell the story, he would cry even before the stroke. After the stroke, it was uncontrollable. Mm. But I'm saying, why would he cry? I think because, again, he embodied that, that yearning. I, I just want to be one with God. I want to speak. God is my, again, like this baby who wants the embrace of his mother. That's all I want. Now, we may not be at that level all the time, but we can and should be at that level some of the time. And if we're not, then it means maybe that that whole inclination has conquered our very essence because that's what it is to, to have this tremendous level of connection. You know, Rabbi Stanz, in fact, would explain this 
I'm going on and on, but I'll give one more parable. I want to then open this up. But he would explain this, this yearning that defines really the, the, the soul and the very being of every human being um, by um, speaking about the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He, he would say this, that he had the privilege of spending hours upon hours with Rabbi Schneerson of blessed memory, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And when, uh, after the Lubavitcher Rebbe passed away, Rabbi Steingartz went to visit that room in which they spoke for hours upon hours. And he realized that in that room, there were many interesting books and manuscripts and old writings. But he said to himself, gosh, when I was here, and I was here for hours upon hours, for, for tens of hours speaking to the rabbi, I never paid attention to the books around me. So how come? I mean, this, this is such a rich, rich room. Mm. And, and then he came to the realization that when he was with the rabbi, as he put it, he was drowned in the eyes of the rabbi. That's the, the expression he used. He was drowned in those eyes. Mm. And when he was drowned in those eyes, nothing, nothing mattered. He was completely transported to a different place. And that feeling also lasted a little bit after the meeting, that he really never paid attention to his surroundings. Now, he used that parable, that, that's, that example, be, uh, to, to describe just this, that there have to be moments in our day to day. And I think prayer is an opportunity for that for a moment like that, in which we say, and it could last for a few seconds, it could last for a few minutes, and the righteous, I believe, have it all the time. But in which in which we say it's I'm I'm so I'm not paying attention to the world. It's not that you're not pay, paying attention again to the opportunities, to the divinity in the world, but to the to the little trivialities and I'm not I'm not paying, I'm so locked, I'm so drowned in the eyes of God that nothing else matters. And that's, that's really what, what the soul, that's how the soul is one with God. On the other hand, again, as we're drowning the eyes of God, we're not God himself. Therefore, we'll never be able to pass through. Rabbi? Yeah. Um, the words hit me in this sen in, in Rabbi's sentence here are earthly intellect and inadequate tool. And, and to me, that's true, not just about divinity, but it's true about a lot going on in the world. I, I wondered, I mean, the reason we're here together is to learn. And I, I, I feel that one of the answers to building a more adequate tool is by learning. Um, do you think that gives, I love learning, so I, I happen to think that way, but. Right. Um, yeah. How can we do more learning in the world well, and have it be accepted? I mean, how, how can that happen? Well, there's all sorts of learnings, right? There's learning through books. There's learning through experience. There's learning mm -hmm. through life. Oh, yeah, I had lots in my 82 years here, kiddo. <laughs> right, right. So really, frankly, we could be learning all the time. Yeah. And maybe that's why that, um, uh, that Mishnah in the Ethics of Our Fathers of in the name of Ben Zoma, who says, Ezel Chacham, who is wise, he learns from every, from every person. Mm -hmm. And he calls it learning. Not who he draws a lesson from every person. Learns. Alomed, we call it out. That's because there's that type of learning. So although we can't be engrossed in our books all the time, but we can, we can exercise that learning. And in a way, that learning is that connection with God. We spoke about this, right? That how God gave his soul into the Torah. Remember the initials of Anochi. And um, when we, we, the Torah again, is not just this, but the Torah is also the world he created. Mm -hmm. To the point that the Zohar says, Istakel bo'raita u'bara alma. That God uh, looked into the Torah and created the world. They say that the Vilna Gaon of 250 years ago was able to learn many of the, um, of the, th the mathematical theories just from the first word of the Torah, Bereshit. And uh, just in that word, I don't know how, but just in that word, he learned a lot of mathematics. Mm -hmm. Now, just as it is that we can look in the Torah and see the world, so too we can look in the world and see the Torah. And when we do that, again, because the Torah, the Torah that encompasses the world, that God forbid does not exclude the world as many people may think, but encompasses the world. Again, 
God looked into the Torah and created the world. So it encompasses the world. When we engage in that sort of learning, then, then we're also becoming one with God. And we're also connecting to God. Whether it's learning from every person in the world or even from every creature in the world, from every fly, from every butterfly, from every tree and stone. And um, what is more important, learning or doing? And without the doing, does the learning even mean anything? That's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. Why uh, would I ask it otherwise? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, I would put it this way. The Talmud asks this question. Uh, what is greater? Learning or doing? And the Talmud answers as follows. That um, learning is great or greater because it brings you to action. So I uh, didn't answer the question. But uh, no, it's a, it's a great answer. So mm -hmm. what you're saying is if there's no action, you're not learning. Yeah, that's correct. I would say that. Absolutely. And, you know, um, many, many lines like that in the Talmud that says, Gadol shimusha yotel milmuda, better to actualize the Torah than to learn it. Uh, that is greater. Uh, but I will say this, that it's, it's, it's really a tango dance, right? Mm -hmm. It takes two to tango, they say. And I think that in a way, <laughs> learning has to propel you to action. What does action do? Action, if you're really connecting to God as you're actualizing your mitzvahs, then it triggers your yearning for learning. Sure. So it's, it's really a, a <laughs> tango dance. Learning has to lead you to action. Action has to lead you to learning. Yeah. Doing, doing the mitzvot brings us one with God. So we always right. want to do the mitzvot. Yeah. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. they're doing. That's right. And it triggers the soul. There's no doubt. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I really believe in the power of mitzvahs. That's why the mitzvah bank in uh, honor of Rabbi Steinsaltz. But, but, but again, I really believe that one mitzvah triggers can trigger the soul. Mm -hmm. You know, countless times. I'm sure Rabbi Eisen can tell you many stories about a mitzvah that a person took upon themselves and, and it, it changed their life. One little mitzvah. How do you explain that? The only way to explain that is from the spiritual mystical standpoint. And that is that a mitzvah, because a mitzvah is a connection with God, so it triggers the God within. And once you've, it's like electricity. Once you've touched it, it's electrified you. Something inside you happens and, and you want to do more. All of a sudden, so, so, you're, so, you're a different so, person. So what you're saying is take that yearning you have and let's move it into doing and into action because that's where you're going to meet God. That's where you're going to be with God in the doing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Very good. So what are we doing today after this learning, Ronnie? We're going to be doing. I, I, I thought I'd come over and have some latkes. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the ultimate level of doing. <laughs> There's a prayer we say every every day multiple times. David, Right, right. You'd be happy to be in the house of God. Right. As close yeah. as possible. That's right. And there's, there's this idea that you can make the house of build the house of God everywhere you are. Uh, there's there was some Hasidic Jews who came to the Tzemach Tzedek, another Hasidic master you to be in Israel and they wanted to move and sometimes he would say yes you should move you should move but to this these specific uh, Hasidim he said in Yiddish mach da eret Israel. make Israel here where you are that's where you should build Israel now, it's not like you can replicate the holiness of Israel but you can certainly create a house of God uh, wherever you are and that's that's really the idea yeah Any other uh, comments before we continue? Disagreements, something. Mm. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Everyone is welcome for latkes, by the way. Everyone. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's continue here at the top of page 133 a little bit. The author is raising the question, speaking of this paradox between God being 
as close as he could be, yet as far as he could be. Does anyone want to continue to read? <laughs> anyone? Margo. I'll read more. Okay, go for it. I don't mind reading at all. Okay, the author is raising the question. If God's wisdom and will are as infinite and unfathomable as himself, how can the Torah, which we do comprehend, be the wisdom of God and the mitzvot, which we enact in our daily lives, be his will? How can we possibly grasp and relate to his wisdom and will? Nevertheless, right. oh, nevertheless. No, 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 continue, continue, yeah. Okay, nevertheless, it is in this connection that it has been said, where you find the greatness of the Holy One, blessed be he, there you find his humility. For the Holy One, blessed be he, has compressed his will and wisdom within the 613 commandments of the Torah and their laws. And in the combination of the letters of the Tanakh and in ex ex expositions thereof, which are to be found in the Agadot and Midrashim of our sages of blessed memory. Right. So um, it, it's an interesting line that says, where you find his greatness, there you will find his humility. Mm. Um, I think it goes the other way around. Where you find his humility, there you will find his greatness. Now, this refers to many, many different things, and we can analyze this verse for hours. But um, in this context, it refers how God contracted himself. Now, there's a difference between contracting and diluting. And that, this has to be emphasized. God forbid, God did not dilute himself in order to create this world, in order for, to, to allow for seeming oppositions to God to exist. Because he could have very well just shown, revealed himself, as will happen when Mashiach will come, that these forces of opposition will just melt away. You know, versus truth, you can't really, the lie can't stand. And when the truth is revealed, I mean, if I say to someone, look, this, the, the grass is green, and it's, it's clear that the grass is green. No, no, one, no one can say that the grass is pink. It's, 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 they'll, they'll, be, they'll be making themselves, you know, appear ludicrous. Same year, God could have revealed his truth completely and then eliminated those forces of evil. But he knew that those forces of evil were an essential component to our life here below. And therefore, he contracted himself to allow those opposing forces to exist and to then give us also the freedom of choice. Now, there's a difference as mentioned before, contracting and diluting. It's not that God forbid God diluted himself and yet we only have like particles of God. But quite opposite, I would say it's like a syrup, right? So you can make, you can make, a, uh, uh, I don't know, you can make a, what are those drinks, those, those lemonades or whatever it is. You can make a lemonade by making the lemonade itself. Or you can contract all the ingredients into a syrup. And then all you need to do is add water because the lemonade is there, just in the syrup in a much more condensed way. And that, that's the way it is. I don't know if it's a good or a bad example. But God contracted himself. And in a way, each time we do a mitzvah, and each time we study Torah too, then we are able to, to, to add water to that syrup, so to speak. And what it does is that it, it then opens up the contraction of that syrup and allows God then to reveal himself more and more and more. Now, um, uh, I that, like that analogy. Okay. <laughs> I think it's excellent. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, then the contraction here in this context is, is, is a, an act of humility for God because, again, contracted. And, uh, but on the other hand, if you really look at that humility, you'll find that, that, that condensation of, of incredible ingredients. And um, you'll find a syrup that can create hundreds of lemonades, if not thousands or infinite amounts of lemonade, so to speak. So, um, that, that's really the idea. I just want to add that it, it's, it, I want to take this in a slightly different direction. And that is that it's interesting to note that Rabbi Steinsaltz, you know, speaking about his relationship with the Lubavitch Rebbe, uh, he, one of the things he said is that sometimes w the more you get to know people, the closer you become, the more disappointed you are. Because then you also... You also learn about their blemishes and whatever it may be. He says with the Lubavitch Rebbe, it was the opposite. The more he came to know him, the more mm. in awe he was. And that's the way it is with great people. 
Now, why? Because they, again, condense themselves in this humility. And it's, what is humility? Humility is, is saying that it's not about me and my selfish self, but it's about my God, my, my being a channel. It's about me just allowing for God to flow within me. And in a way, I think that's, that's really the idea that when, the more you meet people of greatness, the more you see God. And therefore, the less disappointed you are. Now, if it's true for people of God, then it's certainly true for God himself. We really you see no 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 ego, no selfishness, no all you see is light. And and that is an act of tremendous humility because God needed to, he didn't have to create this world, he didn't have to create us, he didn't have to create anything, he doesn't need anything. But he did so nonetheless in order for us to partner with him. And there's no greater act of humility than allowing others to encompass your being. The Talmud says that an arrogant person, God can't dwell with him. In the words of the Talmud, we cannot dwell together. If you're arrogant, God can't, can't dwell with you. Why? Simple reason is because there's no room for God. You took up all the place, all the space. So there's, there's no room for it. The more humble you are, the more you allow God to come into, into the room. The more space there is for God. And in a way, that, that, that is true for God himself. He allowed for us to be partners with him. And that's, that's a sense, that's a, an expression of tremendous humility. But in that humility, you find his greatness too. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, I want to connect this to Hanukkah because <laughs> that's it. We're on uh, in the third day of Hanukkah. Tonight is the fourth candle already, but... Uh, it's, it's quite amazing that uh, Hanukkah, I think, represents the essence of Judaism. And that is that Hanukkah began, if we really want to analyze it, when did really the, the, the idea of Hanukkah begin? I would trace it to the destruction of the first temple. Why then? Because uh, after the destruction of the first temple, the Talmud says, it's, it's fascinating. But the Talmud says, and apparently the sages had that power then, that the sages came together and said, well, this desire, this evil inclination for idol worship is killing our nation. We keep falling into that trap. So they got together and they prayed that this evil inclination for idol worship should be abolished from the world. That people should not desire to worship stones. And they were successful. In the year 586 uh, BCE, the temple, the first temple was destroyed, 587 BCE. They prayed for the abolishment of the inclination. And indeed, from that point on, and we read about it in the prophets too, from that point on, there was no desire really for, for worshiping idols. It all of a sudden disappeared. Now, the problem with that prayer though, is that idol worship was a double-edged sword because there was something good in idol worship. And that is that you want to find divinity within a stone in the most crooked way, of course, but you relegating to the stone a high power. And that's why you bind down to it. When they abolished that evil inclination, all that was left in the eyes of people was stones, was matter, materialistic things. And that gave this great opening for the Greeks to come about. What did the Greeks come and say? That the human body is our God. That not a spiritual God, but that's, that's what it is. That's what life is about. The matter. You want to worship God? How dare you? Do you, you want to keep Shabbat, keep kosher? No. You, we, we like your Torah. They don't want to kill us. They want to kill our soul. They want to kill our connection with God. You, you, Torah is an intellectual book. Great. But take God out of, it, uh, uh, out of the calculation. So it gave room for the Greeks really to come. And, 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 Again, turn the stone into just a stone, into a stone that, that needs to be worshipped because it's stone, not because it has any divinity in it. And then, so what do we do on Hanukkah? Just to, to condense the story, what do we do on Hanukkah? We take the menorah and we illuminate uh, the darkness of the world. What are we doing by this action? What we're doing by this action is that we're saying to ourselves and to the world that there is darkness. There are stones, there are matters in this world, 
but there's light within them. And we'll prove it to you. When we illuminate them, you'll find that they ra radiate too. And in a way, I think that's, that's what we're speaking about. God contracted himself to allow for this darkness to happen, to allow for stones to be seen just as stones. But then when we illuminate them, when we use the power of the Torah, the power of mitzvahs, to go out to the world and to illuminate it, then we're able to also see the divinity within everything and, 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 and now relate to them, not in an idol worship way, but quite opposite in a very divine way, in a way that God is revealed once again. That's, that's really the big idea of Hanukkah. In a way, this is what this is saying, that yes, God contracted himself, but it's our duty to reveal him in, in everything and in his humility, we'll find his greatness, we'll find his great light.